Dateline, Breezewood, Pennsylvania, a collection of gas stations and fast food restaurants just off the turnpike. I'll probably come back to gas stations later, but today I want to talk about drive throughs how they became so prevalent, why they're bad, how they're getting worse, and what some forward-thinking cities are trying to do about it. And it's all coming up next. This is City Nerd, weekly content on cities and transportation. Viewer-suggested topics always welcome. And to be honest, nobody asked for this, but I did want to shout out an old comment I've had sitting around for a while. It came in on my Texas high-speed rail video, which seems like forever ago, from viewer Michael Ibesi, and the comment was, would love a bunch of 10 to 15 minute explorations of questionable urban land uses. And lo, a miniseries was born. So yeah, I do pay attention to things that go viral on Twitter, like Breezewood, but also anytime a fast food place makes a big splash in a new market, you get these wild videos of cars lined up for hours to get fried chicken sandwiches or whatever. Or you get keen observations on the nature of drive through culture and its effects on urban environments. Eh, this is just a good tweet. So I've mentioned drive throughs in passing in a couple videos because they're so integral to the amazing land use and street design you find all over the US. But really, they warrant their own exploration and that's what today is all about. What this video is not about is all the other kinds of drive throughs all of which are kind of awesome. But drive through pharmacies, yeah, and well, this is Vegas, so drive through wedding chapels, and yes, drive through banks. You know, I realize this channel has an international audience, which is very cool, but it was extremely funny to me how many comments I got on previous videos from people who were completely dumbfounded by the idea that drive through banks exist. If you grew up in the US, these are completely normal things that have existed your entire life. Granted, these days most of the bays are just drive up ATMs, but like this one, all the action is in the inner bay where you get to deal with an actual human teller. So I don't know. This is America. Of course there are drive through banks. This is a country where if it can be a drive through, it probably is a drive through. Today though, I'm focusing on fast food joints. Some quick background then. It's hard to say when exactly the first drive through fast food place opened, but I would point to the first location of In N Out Burger, which opened in the LA area, big shocker, in 1948 in Baldwin Park. In N Out was always designed to be a drive through. I mean, it's in the name of the restaurant. The Baldwin Park spot isn't an operating location anymore, but there is an In-N-Out museum at the location if you want to go pay your respects. Contrast McDonald's, which is pretty closely associated to drive through culture in the popular imagination, but actually didn't open its first drive through location until 1975, if you can believe it. And the mid-70s was really when drive through culture started revving up. Oh, that was terrible. And it's never really stopped. McDonald's keeps opening new locations. And you can see in an aerial that this whole area was only half developed in October 2020. And now it's loaded up with drive through fast food joints and they're not even done yet. So what's behind it all? Well, people, Americans specifically, really like drive throughs And I'm gonna come back to that, but also fast food places really love drive through customers. The fact is, people who drive through are much more efficient for fast food joints to handle. They pull up, they pay, they get handed their food, and they go away. The customer does the work for them. They use their own personal vehicle to drive on a transportation system that their tax dollars paid for, for the privilege of probably eating in their car rather than taking up space and dirtying up the fast food joint's dining room. So actually, if you look at how fast food places operate, they prioritize the drive through orders because that's where the most profit is. And that's also the consumer behavior they want to reward. Don't take it from me, take it from someone who's been on the front lines. I love your comments, you guys. I just think this is fascinating, so let's take a closer look at how all this operates. Remember, a drive through joint is trying to do things like 
pump up the average sale, but mainly it's trying to process as many customers as it can at peak times. So they monitor things like how long it takes a customer to order, how long it takes to fill the order. They're all components that determine how profitable the restaurant is gonna be at peak times. The order time is a bit out of the control of staff and it's gonna vary a lot. I mean, I feel sorry for whoever's taking this particular order. I actually have to fast forward. This gap that's developing in front of the car that's ordering, man, that's gonna kill the metrics and management is gonna get a stern talking to. I don't know, is the menu at Raising Cane's really that complicated? Get it together, people. And lines are good to a certain point. It's an advertisement that you have a popular product, but if the lines get too long, that next marginal customer is just gonna skip it. So processing customers quickly is important for managing the line length, but also stores are designed to make the line appear as short as possible with double lane approaches and then the line between the ordering station and the pickup window hidden behind the restaurant. I'm not gonna go into a whole operational analysis here, but three to five minutes is a typical time to fill a drive through order at a lot of places, and they're processing a lot of orders simultaneously. It's actually super interesting, so it goes into things like the throughput, which is somewhere between two and three customers a minute at this fried chicken sandwich establishment, which goes to the very design of the drive through itself, which accommodates something like eight vehicles between the ordering station and the pickup window. Okay, so that's the nuts and bolts of how this kind of business operates. And the operations are important to understand because the nature of them leads to all the things that make fast food drive throughs bad. First of all, the land use. We just talked about the amount of impervious service they devote to drive through queuing, which at busy times still isn't enough. And then they have parking requirements on top of that, which is not just the people who dine in, but also includes all the spots they have to reserve for drive through overflow or mobile pickups. So the building itself is almost always dwarfed by the parking and the drive through operation. And all of that leads to poor urban form, more urban heat island effect, and more runoff. I always like to touch on trip generation because it's an indicator of all the additional vehicle miles traveled we're putting on the system. But I already talked about customer throughput, so I'm not gonna belabor it. Instead, for those of you who wanna nerd out, I'm gonna leave a link to the traffic study for a fried chicken sandwich establishment and a coffee place that's proposed for Monrovia, California. It's a very typical traffic study and it explains all the trip generation, distribution, and parking calculations. It also notes the unique operations of this particular restaurant chain, which does a lot of active management of the queue and designs its parking lots to function as queue overflow during lunch rush and keep the blocking problems out of the adjacent drive aisles and the street system which is kind of nauseating that it has to come to that, but at least the corporate design team is thinking about it. Like, not every restaurant has the foresight to design their way out of blocking situations. This queue at the Golden Arches is just a mess. It spills over into the adjacent drive aisle, and then cars can't really turn right to get in queue. They have to test their three-point turn skills, and it just creates a bunch of conflicts. None of this is ever good for pedestrians. If you're someone who walks, more access points and more wonky turning movements mean more vehicles paying attention to everything but you. Let's face it though, if you're walking, you're a second class citizen to these places anyway. These businesses are set up to streamline drive through orders and keep the queue moving, and you're gonna be a lower priority. Some of these places won't let you in the door at all, and they're not gonna let you walk up to the drive through window. More bad things. One thing you'll notice here is this is a lot of idling. Nobody's turning their car off and restarting it. All of these cars are idling for like 10 minutes minimum, which is about a pound of carbon for every car. Multiply that by maybe 500 to 1,000 customers a day at every single drive through and there are what, maybe a hundred thousand drive throughs in the US? The math is not good, but I do have to praise my viewers for coming up with creative solutions. You guys are on it. While we're on climate, I'm not running a vegan channel here and I'm not gonna tell you what to eat, 
but just something to consider. Litter is a thing. Takeout food generates additional packaging garbage that may or may not be disposed of properly. And this last one is a touchy subject, but we spend a lot on healthcare in this country. And yeah, there are a lot of dumb, systemic, probably corrupt reasons for that. But it's hard to deny that our sedentary lifestyles and poor diet contribute a lot to that as well. I'm not into fat shaming. I personally love to eat, but the fact that these places are so ubiquitous makes it a huge uphill battle for all of us to avoid putting counterproductive things into our bodies. Okay, I'm gonna get some thoughts on the future of the drive-through and what some cities are doing to limit the damage they do to the urban environment. But first, quick reminder to drop a like on the video and potentially subscribe if you're into tedious explorations of suboptimal land uses. There's a Patreon if you're looking for ways to directly support my slow descent into madness. Subcount check. The channel now has enough subscribers to fill MetLife Stadium, home of the New York Jets and the football giants. I talked about the sheer amount of parking this complex has in a previous video. The New York metro area just seems like a very weird spot to have something this car-centric. I'm not going to do too much about the future of the drive through just because the future is super hard to predict and it's only getting harder. But it does seem like it's headed toward more automation and less human interaction. Like Burger King is looking to introduce a Amazon style locker system with key codes so people never have to interact with service workers. I don't know, is that progress or dystopia? There's a good Slate article that came out earlier this month that covers a lot of this, and really, Henry Grabar is always worth a read. I'll leave a link in the description. So here's a question I don't really have an answer for. Is it worse for a thousand people to individually drive their cars to a fried chicken sandwich establishment, idle for 10 minutes, pick up their order and drive away? Or is it worse if they all stay home and some Grubhub employee who's probably netting something less than minimum wage delivers all their orders to them? Honestly, both models kind of drive me crazy. And is it really too much to ask that we all have the option of living in areas where we can just walk or bike to places that have good food? Anyway, I'm interested in your thoughts. Let's not be naive though. New locations keep on opening and the lines are still crazy. And if this is really what Americans like, then who's to say it's wrong? You get to sit in your climate controlled personal vehicle and experience minimal human interaction. It's like the exact opposite of a third place. Yeah, on second thought, these days the car probably is most people's third place. We already talked about the deleterious aspects of drive throughs bad land use, bad pedestrian environments, too much pavement. So what if you want to live in a jurisdiction that puts its foot down and says, we don't want this in our city? Well, the choices are limited. Probably the highest profile city to ban new drive throughs is Minneapolis. In 2019, the city council adopted an ordinance prohibiting construction of new drive through facilities throughout the city with the goal of reducing negative impacts from emissions, impervious surface, transportation conflicts, and basically all the things we talked about earlier. The other interesting city here is Portland. Pretty much anywhere else, if the dining room is closed, they're not going to serve you if you're not in a car. But this is Portland, so the city added language to its code that says, when a drive through facility is open and other pedestrian-oriented customer entrances to the business are unavailable or locked, the drive through facility must serve customers using modes other than a vehicle, such as pedestrians and bicyclists. Portland, out here solving fast food equity problems. Let's wrap this up. In general, we're talking about an entire market segment that is specifically built not to benefit people who don't live a car-dependent life. Eh, unless you're in Portland. They don't care about you. Their food is designed in a central lab to maximize addictiveness, not your lifespan. Their building footprints are based on a few basic templates, none of which promote a livable public realm. 
They don't want you to come in their store. They're more than happy to have you put miles on your personal vehicle in order to buy food that's probably been sitting under a heat lamp for a while. So what can you do? Well, support independence. It's not that hard anymore. You have a phone, it's got ratings and reviews on it. Even if you live in a suburban environment, a lot of the best food is in strip mall places opened by people who have a dream and put a lot of love into what they're doing. And I always hear this argument about chain restaurants, that people like them because they're predictable and consistent, and independent places are scary. Well, predictable and consistent isn't really good if it's just consistent mediocrity. Okay, that concludes this episode of Gastro Nerd. Thanks for watching today, and thanks to the patrons for funding the purchase of a double double protein style for research purposes, of course. Keep the great topic suggestions coming. I'll be back with a new episode next week, and I'll see you then.